Today on Applied Science, we're going to talk about Olestra. That's right, that crazy calorie-free cooking oil from the 90s. This oil was used to make WOW brand potato chips. It sounds great, it has no calories from fat. But it didn't take long for this product to land on late-night comedy TV with the punchline, anal leakage. Uh, apparently, if you ate too many of these chips, your underwear was going to suffer. And even today, if you search for the history of Olestra, uh, it's on like Time's list of worst inventions of the century, and it's like, oh, it was dumb scientists, you know, what were they thinking? But as we'll see, that's not actually a fair characterization of how this thing worked. And there was research done that even asking people who had gastric distress from the Olestra products were called in for a double-blind study, and there was no effect. So anyway, it's a really interesting product from both a product and marketing standpoint as well as the chemistry. So in today's video, we're going to synthesize our own Olestra, and then I'm going to fry a little potato chip in there and do a taste test live on camera. According to legend, the food scientists at Procter & Gamble were actually trying to make a super calorie dense formula for prematurely born babies, you know, so that they can gain weight more quickly. So they decided to join sugar and fat molecules together in an unnatural way, thinking that that would increase the calorie density. Why they didn't just mix the sugar and fat together like they were making cookies, I don't know. But anyway, let's just go with the story here. Um, to their surprise, this super you know, sugar fat molecule actually had no calories at all. The reason being that we have no digestive enzymes to crack it apart. Even though it is very calorie dense, looking at its components, we just can't digest it. And so this sugar fat basically just passes all the way through the system and you know, comes out the bottom, which is where this problem with the anal leakage comes from. In biological systems, the main way to store fats is this triglyceride. So whether you're an olive or a fish or a human, uh, this same basic structure is how fats are created and digested. And so the idea is that we have a glycerin backbone, which has three sockets, and then we plug these fatty acids into those three sockets. And the thing that determines what kind of fat this is, anything from beef fat all the way to, you know, canola oil, is just the length of these carbon chains and the shape of these carbon chains. So they could be kinked or they could be saturated with hydrogen or unsaturated with hydrogen. Um, this one is famous, the omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, but the basic structure of this three socket thing is replicated many, many places in nature. So what we do with this unnatural sugar fat molecule as it turns out, sucrose, just plain old table sugar, actually functions a lot like glycerin. It has these sockets where we can plug in fatty acids. But as it turns out, sucrose has eight sockets to plug into instead of just the three. So to get these two to react with each other, the first thing we have to do is cut off the glycerol and free these fatty acids into a mixture that we're going to mix with the sucrose. And as it turns out, this is the first step in making biodiesel. So what we do is we take this triglyceride. This could be anything, olive oil, canola. In my experiments, I found out canola oil was the most reliable, but you really can use anything you want. And it will have an effect on the final fat. So if we start with olive oil, that's going to be a very uh, low density sort of thing. Uh, our, our ending olestra will be a low density olestra. Whereas if you start with beef fat or something like that, it's going to be a much more um, saturated, a much more heavy fat, um, you know, solid at room temperature potentially. So <laughs> the ingredients in making olestra include biodiesel, no joke. The first step in making this thing is to make some biodiesel. Uh, so we start with canola oil and mix it with methanol and a strong base, in this case, potassium hydroxide. And what happens is the hydroxide splits this apart and the methanol reacts with the ends of these fatty acids to make a um, fatty acid methyl ester, a fame. The glycerol is more dense and in a separatory funnel, it sinks to the bottom and we uh, discard that, we don't need it. And the rest of it is this biodiesel, the fatty acid methyl esters, which are somewhat reactive and we can use these to join them onto the sucrose molecules. The next challenge is getting the biodiesel and the sugar to mix together. As you know from playing around in the kitchen, sugar doesn't dissolve in oily substances, or maybe we don't really play with biodiesel that much in the kitchen, but it's very similar to oils in sort of, you know, how it mixes with things. And so if we were making this just for chemical analysis, we could use a solvent maybe that dissolves both the sugar and the biodiesel. 
and then that solvent would be our base in which all these reactions are going to happen. But as it turns out, there aren't that many good choices of solvents that are non-toxic and, and or easy to remove from the reaction later on. So the challenge is to find something that's more or less food safe. So if there's a trace of it left in there, it's not a problem. And it also does a good job of letting the biodiesel get into good contact with the sugar. And as it turns out, soap is actually a really good solution to that problem. Um, literal plain old soap is actually what we use to join, to allow the sugar to mix in with the biodiesel. And so, you know, you couldn't really use soap from the bathroom because it's got all these other things mixed into it. But I mean pure chemical soap, uh, which in this case we're going to make from the oil itself. So again, we start with the uh, canola oil and react it with water and a base this time instead of methanol and a base. And we get a different product out. Instead of getting biodiesel, we get soap. One of the most time consuming aspects of this whole process was figuring out how to dry the soap, believe it or not. So we get this sort of slurry of um, very basic water and soap, and we need to turn that into a powder for the later reactions. Water is a super big problem in all of these reactions from the biodiesel all the way to the sucrose um, synthesis or the Lestra synthesis. So drying the soap out took a long time in vacuum and heat. And then we have to wash it in alcohol to help get the last traces of hydroxide and water out of there. But eventually, I ended up with a pretty nice powder, and uh, it's, it's dry enough to use in this reaction. I should point out that the reason the soap works is because it has this ionic charge to it. And so it allows um, the nonpolar part of this, like you've, you know, you've heard of like lipids and stuff. It, uh, the soap basically joins um, nonpolar molecules to polar molecules. And we can see it's because it's got this long tail that's oily and the head that has a charge to it, allowing it to stick to polar things. So this allows the sugar to join to the um, fatty parts of the mixture more effectively. And it's non-toxic. I mean, if there's a teeny tiny bit of soap left, uh, it's not nearly as big of a problem as if you used some really nasty hydrocarbon solvent or something like that. So the ingredients list so far is the biodiesel, uh, the soap, and the sugar. And for the sugar, uh, you, you want to use something very finely divided so that we get a high surface area. Even though the soap is going to help everything dissolve, it still helps a lot to have very high surface area. So you're thinking you might want to use powdered sugar, but powdered sugar from the store contains anti-caking agents. I think they put cornstarch or something in there. So actually using granulated sugar in a coffee grinder or a, a ball mill or some other kind of grinder is the way you want to go so that you, you know you have just pure sucrose. And I used a coffee grinder. And it's very effective. I was surprised. Just a few seconds in there with granulated sugar and it comes out just completely fine powder. And then finally, we need a catalyst. So now we've got, you know, the sugar in good mixing uh, ability with the biodiesel and the soap and everything in there. But uh, even at temperature, there's not enough, um, <laughs> there's not enough oomph to get the reaction going. We need a catalyst. And in the patents that I was following, by the way, there was a really good patent I found. It took hours and hours of searching to find this specific patent because there's, there's a lot of them and there's a lot of research papers. But I did find this one key patent that makes the process very easy to understand. And in there, they used uh, sodium hydride as their catalyst. Sodium hydride is so reactive that it's typically sold in oil slurry. Like sodium hydride is a powder, but you can't just handle the powder because it would react with water in the air and everything else. So it's sold as an oil slurry. And uh, I was thinking of buying this, but I figured ah, I'll just use one of the other catalysts they suggested. And you can actually use sodium metal as the catalyst. I have a feeling it reacts in the, um, in, in the bath to make you know, meth oxide or something like that, sodium meth oxide maybe, but I don't know. Uh, and um, I estimated how much I should put in there and just cut off a little bit of sodium metal and dropped it in and it worked great. So what's happening in the main reaction is we've got these fatty acids with a methyl group on the end. Remember, we made the biodiesel with methanol, so the fatty acid now has a methyl attached to the end of it. So when we put it in our bath with the catalysts and everything, that methyl is stripped off and the fatty acid is attached to the sucrose and the methyl becomes methanol, which is a byproduct of this reaction. And we need to get rid of that, one, be, one because it's poisonous and we don't want it. But also, I think uh, if the methanol concentration gets too high, uh, too much of the catalyst and everything might get concentrated in the methanol phase and it, it may not react, you know, it may just slow everything down. 
So what we do is conduct this entire reaction in a flask under vacuum, and it's hot, it's about 150 degrees C, and the methanol instantly vaporizes and gets pulled away by the vacuum system. So as the methanol is created, and a fair bit of it will be created, um, we get rid of it as the reaction is going. I think the temperature of 150 degrees C was chosen because it's just below the caramelization point of sucrose. So the idea is we want it to be as hot as possible to get a fast reaction, but not so hot that it causes caramelization or burning, which was actually still a problem for me. Um, one challenge is that even with the soap and everything else, the um, sucrose doesn't really want to dissolve in, the, in this oily biodiesel mixture. So if the sucrose falls to the bottom, it gets burned, and as soon as it caramelizes or burns, it can't be used in the reaction. Also, side note, I, I've been using uh, sand baths, you know, that's a round bottom flask and you want really gentle heating in there. And one idea is to use sand to kind of conduct the heat from the, the hot plate up into the flask. This is a terrible idea. You know, it ends up being super messy, just as messy as oil immersion. And the sand is very uneven and it's hard to measure and you can't stir it. It's just a total mess. So I've gone back to oil baths and had a much more successful time with it. So anyway, after this whole process is done, we need to wash our product. There could be uh, unused catalyst, you know, sodium left over in there in the soap, of course. So we wash it in methanol and the methanol is much lighter than the oil. So we can drain off the oil out the bottom and uh, throw away the methanol. And you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, methanol is poisonous. Why would we use that? It's true, but it is easy to remove. Um, since the boiling point is so low, what we do is after the washings, we put this thing back into the vacuum flask and heat it up under vacuum and it bubbles. The methanol is coming off as vapor. And when the bubbling stops, we know we've got all the methanol out because it's, it has such a low boiling point. Another interesting technique that I learned about for the first time in this process is the so-called use of bleaching earth. Uh, apparently all commercially produced oils, olive oils, you know, seed oils, all this stuff are bleached, but that's not really a good word for it. You basically mix the oil with this powdered substance and the powder soaks up off colors and impurities. And then you filter the oil, taking the powder out along with all those impurities. Pretty magic stuff. And so as you can see, the oil that we had is very contaminated with carbon and caramelized sugar and whatnot. And so we mix it with this powderized magic bleaching earth and then vacuum filter that and we end up with this amazingly clear product. It uh, does amazingly good job. So I did this twice and ended up with a product that looks pretty good. It's still not perfectly straw colored. It's it got a slight uh, tinge of, of caramelization still to it, but it's clean enough to move forward. All right, so we're getting ready to fry our potato chip here. We've got the Olestra on the left and regular canola oil on the right. I was planning to make bigger quantities than this, but um, you know, I had yield problems and whatever. But anyway, as our oil is heating up, I thought we'd talk about what happened to Olestra as a product and what's going to happen to it. As I said, in the mid 90s, the hate train got rolling so fast that it really didn't get a fair shake. But uh, Procter & Gamble had invested 20 years and hundreds of millions of dollars, so clearly it didn't make sense to just give up right away. Um, as I said, they did follow-up research, and in that first study, they had people come in in a double-blind, um, even switched back and forth study, where they had some people eat the Olestra chips first and other people eat the regular chips first and couldn't find anything. But some of the criticisms was that they weren't eating enough. It was also it was an N of only 50. So they did another study where they had a thousand people come in and watch a two hour movie and allowed them to eat as many potato chips as they wanted. Some got the Olestra chips, some people got the regular chips. Guess what, no difference. Even unlimited, uh, you know, unlimited uh, supply of potato chips, people would not eat themselves to a point where they had gastric distress. So, you know, <laughs> it remains one of those unsolved mysteries. Does it actually cause problems or not? My feeling is that probably not, although, if you ate a family-sized bag of potato chips made with Olestra in one sitting, I can imagine that that would cause problems. And so if that's what people do, then maybe it doesn't work as a product. One other interesting aspect of this is that it's um, very relevant for healthcare. Like people think that this is just sort of a, a nice little product to have, where it's like, oh yeah, you can eat twice the potato chips and have the same number of calories. Well, it's true, that is utility for customers, but 
thinking broadly, you know, eating too many calories is actually a huge problem for our whole population. In the U.S. here, everyone agrees that eating too many calories is a super big problem, and it's not just a nuisance issue. It actually translates to real dollars. If we had everyone consuming slightly fewer calories than they do now, we would spend significantly less on health care, and people would have longer, healthier lives. It's, no one disputes that. The challenge is that some people are opposed to technological means for reducing this. If you go to the doctor, you'll say, you know, well, you should eat less and exercise more. Um, great, but that doesn't work. So that's what they've been saying for decades, and we're still not on a good trajectory. So having technological solutions like this is acceptable to some and not others. Finally, you know, this idea is just too good to let go. And so there are other companies starting up with other ideas um, of how to do non-calorie uh, cooking oils. And so there's another company I found that's uh, got a new molecule. It's not the same as Olestra. It's a modified triglyceride that has uh, some other piece of molecule stuffed between the glycerin and the fatty acids. Um, but the end result is the same. It's essentially not digestible or it's only partially digestible so that you don't get the full calorie brunt of those fatty acids. By the way, Procter & Gamble tried again too. Uh, in the mid-90s, that's when this product was initially released and you know, we know how that went. And then uh, some years went by and I think in the mid-2000s there was another product launch, Lay's Light Potato Chips. And so P&G made a much smaller deal of, the, of it containing Olestra for obvious reasons. Uh, that word Olestra, Olean is the brand name given to Olestra, which is the generic name for this modified fat. Um, but even then, it didn't sell very well. And I think some angry consumers were concerned that it had Olestra in there, only marked in the back in the ingredients label. And they wanted the labeling to be more prominent on the front. And I think at that point, P&G just decided to throw in the towel. So as far as I know, there are no products made with Olestra, although if you look it up in Wikipedia, they claim there's some products worldwide, but I've searched around and I, I don't think so. I don't think anyone is actually using it. If someone knows otherwise, please put it in the comments. Okay, let's fry some potato chips. So I've got some small potatoes to fit into our small beakers there. Like I say, I was trying to get a little bit more in terms of volume. It's a little more frothy on the left. Kind of makes you think like maybe this whole uh, anal leakage thing kind of starts with the oil itself, huh? <laughs> All right, now for the taste test. First, the regular canola oil. Very good. And now for the Olestra. They taste really good. They're, they're exactly the same in taste. I'm not going to eat so many of them, though, to find out what this threshold is for the anal leakage. We'll save that for another episode, maybe. Well, anyway, I hope you found that interesting. See you next time. Bye.